Um, my talk today will be on EGAT vets for uh, envelope tracking buck converters, in particular looking at higher power applications such as base stations. The agenda today will first look at uh, the concept of envelope tracking and what is required to, uh, to do this and why are we doing it. Secondly, we'll look at EGAN FETs and how could they be used for envelope tracking. To use them, we need to maximize the performance of these devices and what are the characteristics and changes that we need to do to actually achieve that. Then we'll look at some experimental results using the EGAN FETs and we'll, from that we'll be able to see what the actual current limitations are on further pushing the performance of these devices. And finally, we'll have a summary and hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. So, to a quick overview of envelope tracking. So, why envelope tracking? As we can see from this mobile data forecast, data rates are expected to grow at a compound rate of about 66% per year. To keep pace with this exceptional growth in uh, data, modern modulation techniques such as 4G LTE are required to increase the spectral density and pack more data bits into every RF channel. This results in increasingly complex waveforms with increasing peak to average power ratios expressed in terms of PAPR. This increase in PAPR has had a serious impact on the efficiency of the RF amplifiers which has actually gone down even with improvements in material and technology. To better understand why the conceptual RF amplifier uh, efficiency gra graph versus output power is shown. We can see that at maximum output power on the top right corner a peak efficiency of as high as 65 percent is achievable. However, as the peak to average power ratio increases, the amplifier spends more and more time at lower and lower average output power and you end up with a system that has an efficiency of about 25 percent or even lower. With this difference between the fixed DC supply and this modulated RF envelope, the output is directly, sorry, let me repeat that sentence. With the difference between DC supply voltage and the modulated RF envelope, the output directly translates into losses. So why envelope tracking? If you can replace the fixed supply with a variable supply that follows the RF modulated envelope, it is possible to push the efficiency of the RF amplifier back to close, that, close to that of the peak efficiency. In doing so, you can reduce the overall losses of the RF amplifier down to about a third of what it, what it would have been and also uh, increase the overall efficiency by at least 25 percentage points. However, to achieve this, for LTE as an example, you need a power supply that has a bandwidth of between 60 and 100 megahertz. So how is this implemented? Currently there is no single switching solution that can get the efficiency uh, and achieve the bandwidth that is required. So most systems end up being hybrid you end up with a system that has a switching stage that has high efficiency and generates most of the power um, and lower bandwidth. And this is supplemented by a linear stage that has low efficiency but high bandwidth to generate the overall bandwidth that is required. If you are able to improve the performance of the switching device, you can improve the overall efficiency of the envelope tracking power stage. You could also push the frequency and bandwidth of the switching stage higher. This in turn will simplify the linear stage design or in extreme cases can remove the, the linear stage entirely. Alternatively, the linear stage bandwidth can be proportionally increased and this allows you to actually improve the fidelity of the RFPA. So why EGAN fits for envelope tracking? Firstly, we need to consider the switching losses uh, in the devices. For these kind of applications, the devices will be hot switching in the multi-megahertz range. 
for traditional hot switching transition, switching losses are impacted by two device parameters, QGD, known as the Miller charge, and QGS2, which is the portion of the gate source charge between the threshold voltage and the plateau voltage of the device. The turn-on period begins with an increase in the gate voltage when the gate voltage reaches the device threshold. The current through the device will begin to increase being driven by the gate current IG. During this current rising period, the device encounters both current and voltage, resulting in switching loss. For the current rising period, the device parameter that determines the amount of loss is QGS2. When the device current reaches the load current, the voltage across the device starts dropping. Uh, the rate at which this drop is determined by the device parameter QGD. Uh, similarly, at turn off, the same two parameters are involved. To minimize the switching losses in a hot switching application, you need to minimize both QGD and QGS in a device for a given RDS on. The hot switching performance of a device can be predicted by considering the product of the RDS on and the sum of the QGD, QGS2 product. This is known as the hot switching figure of merit. Comparing the switching performance of different voltages between EGAN FETs and traditional switching MOSFETs, here the best MOSFETs for different vendors are plotted against the second generation EGAN FETs as well as the latest fourth generation low RDS on EGAN FETs. From this we can see that the EFETs offer more than eight times improvement in hot switching figure of merit at 200 volt about a six times improvement at 100 volt and still a respectable three and a half times improvement down at 30 volts compared to silicon devices. For very high frequency operation, lower power uh, applications such as base station envelope tracking, the third generation EGAN FETs are developed with resistance values in the hundreds of milliohm range and voltages ranging from 40 to 100 volt. Please note that the typical charges presented here are in picocoulomb and not nanocoulomb as is typical. Similarly, the CRSS or Miller capacitance are expressed in terms of a fraction of a picofarad. To see how these devices compare against comparable higher RDS on MOSFET, the hot switching figure of merit is shown again and in this case we show it against the 8005 as an example third generation device. The EPC 2007, 100 volt second generation low RDS on device. And for the MOSFETs to compare against, we were able to, uh, unable to find any higher RDS on MOSFETs with comparable figures of merit other than these 30 volt PGA MOSFETs. From this, we can see that the 100 volt second generation device has a figure of merit comparable to that of the best 30 volt PGA MOSFET. In contrast, in contrast, the EPC 8005 has about half the figure of merit of the 30 volt PGA MOSFET while being capable of supporting voltages twice as high as that of the MOSFET. It is these kinds of improvements in figure of merit that allow to drive the switching losses in the GAN FETs down compared to MOSFET devices. But figure of merit isn't the only criteria for importance at high frequency hot switching applications. As the switching frequency increases, it becomes harder and harder to keep the gate extremely low during high VDT transients and prevent the VDT induced turn on. For such high frequency applications, the device will inherently the VDT turn on unless immunity is assured. To achieve this, the Miller ratio, which is defined as QGD over QGS1, needs to be less than 1. Alternatively, QGS1 needs to be larger than QGD. The plateau region here, QGD, can be seen for an EPC 8004 FET, and we can see that it's significantly smaller than the QGS1 region for the same device. And this is true not only up to 20 volt, where the data sheet are typically shown, but all the way to its fully rated voltage of 40 volt. This means that uh, EPC 8004 as well as the other third generation EPC GAN FETs are DVD-T immune inherently. 
In the preceding slides, we show that the EGAN FETs have a significant figure of merit and hard switching performance improvement over MOSFETs. They have the necessary parameters to effectively avoid high DVDT turn on. But device parameters alone are not sufficient in a circuit performance. To maximize the performance of these devices, the device and circuit parasitics need to be minimized, and these will be described in the next slides. Considering the hard switching loss diagram presented earlier, in practical application, the common source inductance, which is the inductance between the source side of the device common to both the power and gate loops, will, during the, the IDT interval, create a voltage that opposes the applied gate voltage. In essence, the gate drive current IG will be reduced. This translates into an increase in the current rise time interval and the proportional increase in the switching losses. Although common source inductance is the most important device parasitic, all parasitic inductances of the package impact in circuit performance. The common source inductance phenomena and importance of package parasitics are well understood. The semiconductor industry has improved the packaging over time. MOSFETs devices are dominated by two-sided structures with the gate and source connection on one side and the drain on the other. For an original SO8 MOSFET package, the drain side was orientated to face the PCB and connected to the drain that was elevated above the board with the connection made for the, uh, through a four-pin lead frame. The gate and source pins located on the top side of the die were bonded to the lead frame and connected to the PCB. For all of these connections, the distance from the die to the PCB were large, introducing large parasitics and degrading switching performance. Looking at the loss breakdown for an SO8 package, it is shown that only about 20% of the switching losses are a result of the die while 80% uh, of the losses are induced by the parasitics of the package. To improve device performance, the LF pack was introduced. The LF pack mounts the drain of the device directly onto a large pad underneath the die, reducing the parasitics of the drain connection. The source connection is slightly improved by the addition of a copper strap, but again is limited by the large connection distance between the source connection and the PCB. For the LF pack, 73% of the losses result from the package. Understanding the importance of minimizing common source inductance, the next evolution in packaging was the direct fed. The direct fed flipped the orientation of the die, allowing the gate and source pads to be mounted directly to the PCB, minimizing gate and source parasitics. The penalty paid for the reorientation is that the die's drain was now located on the top side and had to be connected down to the PCB, increasing the drain parasitics. The RECFET improved performance over its predecessor reduced packaging related losses to less than half. For the E-GANFET, a higher voltage lateral device, all the connections are connected are contained on the same side of the die. This allows the die to be mounted directly on the PCB minimizing the total parasitics in the internal busing and external solder bumps. For further decreased parasitics, the drain and source connections are arranged in an interleaved linear grid array, providing multiple parallel connections to the PCB from the die. The resulting improvement in packaging is a significant reduction in the package-related losses, with only about 18% of the losses originating from the package. This shows that as we move to higher and higher frequency, the packaging becomes even more critical. This improved packaging allows EGANFETs to operate at frequencies not possible for traditional MOSFETs. And by improving device figures of merit with unmatched low parasitic packaging. We've stated that common source inductance is crit critical in power loss for hard switching converters. And we can see this here in a graph as you know how the losses can significantly increase with just a small increase in common source inductance. However, as the circuit and PCB related parasitics in the power loop is also a significant impact on the overall switching losses. And this is shown for a low voltage high current application. 
to push the switching frequency higher not uh, does not just require low packaging parasitic, but also low PCB and layout parasitics, especially on the power loop. We can now look at the pinout of the EPC 8000 series uh, third generation EGAN fit. And we can see the differences from the standard uh, land grid array EGAN fit shown pre previously. The devices have two separate parallel gate and gate return terminals on the left side of the die, while the power source and drain terminals are located on the top and bottom of the die, also parallel but orthogonal to the gate pads. To understand the impact of this configuration on the PCB inductance, let's consider a half bridge buck with two devices in series. The separate gate return, which is a source connection, allows the gate circuit to be um, free of common source inductance outside the die and, and all but eliminates the total common source inductance of the design. The wider solder bars for the gate circuitry reduces the inductance of the gate circuit, thereby enhancing the speed and of the connection to the gate driver. The gate and drain solder bars are designed so that the optimum current paths are 90 degree with respect to each other. This significantly reduces the interaction between the gate circuit and the drain circuit, effectively reducing the coupling between these two uh, loops. To close the gate and power loops are simply achieved by VIing down to the next adjacent PCB layer. By placing the drains source and gate return terminals parallel to each other and perpendicular to the power and gate current flow, it is possible to have shorter, wider connections with the loop return current in the first inner layer flowing equal and opposite direction with respect to the top conductor. This equal and opposite currents creates coupling and flux cancellation between the two layers resulting in an overall reduction reduction of the loop inductances. To summarize, the generation benefits are designed for high frequency hot switching applications. 40, 65 volt and 100 volt higher RDS on devices were created especially for very high frequency operation. The reduction in QGD in particular was done to improve the hot switching figure of merit of the device and this for, for devices with complete the VDT immunity. Separation of the gate and power loops through the use of a gate return pad all but eliminates common source inductance while the rotation of the drain source pads with respect to the gate, gate return pads allows for optimum layout to reduce both the power loop and gate loop inductances. So moving on to the experimental results. So how do these devices actually stack up? Here's an example of a um, envelope tracking uh, prototype board that was built as a just as a buck converter and we can see the LM5113 gate driver and two EPC 8000 series devices plus the high frequency bus caps uh, with respect to an SO8 footprint. We can see that the whole design is about half the size of an SO8. At lower voltages the, and high current, the hard switching time is uh, in the order of about 500 picoseconds to switch to 20 volts. While on the ZVS side, because of the lower output capacitance, the commutation time is in the order of around 400 picoseconds. Please, please note that there's almost no measurable overshoot. Similarly, at lower voltages, it is possible to achieve efficiencies close to 90% at 10 megahertz, um, even for step-down ratios as high as 4 to 1. If we now increase the bus voltages to uh, more realistic values for uh, base station applications, we can see again that there's almost no measurable overshoot on the switching node during hard switching transition. And the, the IDT and VDT intervals of the switching uh, tran uh, transition are clearly distinguishable. The peak commutation rate is around 75 volts per nanosecond, resulting in an overall rise time of about 1 nanosecond with the total switching time in, in the range of 1.2 nanoseconds. The overall efficiency that was achieved 
is again close to 90% for a 2 to 1 step down ratio at 10 megahertz outputting about 40 watts of power. However, it's interesting to note that at light load, the total loss is around 2 watts, which is significantly higher than was the case for the lower voltage results. When a breakdown of the loss analysis is done, accounting for the conduction, switching, output capacitance, gate driver, and magnetic losses, there is still about a watt of additional losses that is not readily explained from the given efficiency results. To understand where these come from and what the current limitations are, we look at the parasitics within the gate driver itself. To better understand them, consider the following half-bridge circuit with two devices uh, with the driver having an internal level shifter. We can see that during a switch node rising edge that any parasitic capacitance within the IC between the high side well and ground needs to be charged up through the bootstrap capacitor to ground. This current um, flows through the bootstrap capacitor and the resultant energy is equivalent to an additional COSS loss component as uh, the charge are, um, can be considered to be in parallel with the bottom MOSFET. Similarly, when the bottom MOSFET is on, the bootstrap diode of the driver is charging up the high side bootstrap supply. When a rising edge happens, this diode needs to stop conducting and start blocking voltage. This results in diode reverse recovery charge. These two components are quite significant at these high, higher frequencies and higher WDTs. To determine the, their relative sizes and their impact, consider the following no load buck converter showing an inverted inductor current and a switch node voltage with significant dead time to show almost complete ZVS transitions. We can see that characteristically there's a significant difference in the voltage rising and falling slopes even though the peak and valley inductor currents are the same. Secondly, there's a very slow initial rising edge on the, on the rising uh, switch node edge. When using the current and the output capacitance of the devices, the expected commutation rate is significantly faster than what is being observed. The differences are accounted for with the well capacitance of the device and the bootstrap diode reverse recovery as stated previously. On the falling edge, there is no diode reverse recovery, so all the additional um, increase in charge are allocated towards the well capacitance of the driver. On the rising edge, the additional charge is allocated towards the reverse recovery of the bootstrap diode. With these two loss components accounted for in the design, both the diode reverse recovery and the increased uh, driver well capacitance as related to COSS, uh, almost all the losses are now accounted for. The increased COSS is so significant compared to the size of these devices that it actually significantly increases the peak switching current, which further induces a small amount of increase in switching losses as well. From this, we can see that although the efficiencies achieved are, are quite good, there's a significant amount of further improvement that is possible with an improvement in the driver parasitics used. Uh, the black line indicated here shows the efficiency that could be achieved if these two parasitic components were eliminated. So, in summary, the new devices shown here for the uh, EPC EGAN FETs third generation enable much higher hard switching frequency applications, such as base station envelope tracking. Switching at 42 volts, 10 megahertz, and Outputting 40 watts is possible at efficiencies of close to 98%, uh, 89%. However, the driver parasitics limit the performance with light load losses uh, that can potentially be cut in half and the full load losses can be reduced by as much as 25%. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions?